Faith in the Fog is based on an excellent sermon series presented by Pastor Lance Lowell of Neighborhood Church in Modesto, California. Pastor Lowell gave me his sermon notes and encouraged me to design a video series. The episodes that you will see are a collaboration between Pastor Lowell and myself. I hope you enjoy this production. Let's return to that amazing day we read about in the second half of Mark, chapter 6. Imagine being there to witness the miracle of the feeding of 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. Thousands of people came to hear Jesus preach that day. The crowds were astonished at his doctrine because Jesus taught with authority, not like the scribes. No one, not even the most studied rabbi, had this kind of understanding of God and Scripture. But that wasn't all. Then came the most amazing miracle. Jesus fed 5,000 people with only five loaves of bread and two fish. But at this point, the narrative takes a strange turn. Mark says that Jesus immediately instructed his disciples to take a boat to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and meet him at Bethsaida. And that quick, the mountaintop experience faded. What would come next? Let's read. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. These four verses record an event that was terrifying and dangerous. It is difficult to deny that this storm threatened both life and limb. The fury of the wind and the waves seriously challenged the fledgling faith of Christ's disciples. There is one verse in this short narrative that is a source of confusion to many in the faith, and that verse is Mark chapter 6 verse 48. We see Jesus watching his disciples straining at the oars and he did nothing. Why would Jesus do such a thing? Why would Jesus sit on a hill and watch his disciples strain at the oars? Why didn't Jesus immediately rescue his disciples? This is not the image of the Savior we want to see. It's hard for us to imagine that our Lord Jesus would sit by and watch his disciples struggle. Does Jesus also sit on a mountainside and watch us struggle when we confront the adversities of life? This is a painful question 
that most do not want to answer. We must realize that as surely as life brings seasons of comfort and convenience, it can also bring challenge and controversy. There is an uncertainty in life that can confront us each day. Life can be an unpredictable adventure filled with struggle and hard work. The storms of life can rage against us, and we might also find ourselves straining at the oars, attempting to make progress against the winds of adversity. We might think that the only struggle the disciples experienced that night was at the oars, but this is not the case. The greater struggle came from their fear, confusion, and self-doubt. Where is Jesus? Did he send us out here to die? And that quick, a spiritual fog surrounded his disciples. Fear, not faith, became their natural human reaction. They entered a spiritual fog and all around them seemed distorted. Maybe there is a reason why God allows His children to struggle. The Apostle James understood that there is a correlation between the struggles we face and the faith we develop. Let's read. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James understood that the trials we face are designed to test our faith because a faith properly exercised will develop the other fruits of the Spirit. Let's study the three reasons why struggle is necessary. Why do I struggle in life? I thought being a Christian would put an end to my struggles. I thought the Christian life would be filled with God's warm glow and I could rest in the loving arms of my Savior. I struggle so when I study the Bible and attempt to pray. It seems I'm in a thick gray fog and I no longer can sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. These are thoughts we all experience at one time or another. We all thought being a Christian would be a fun-filled, exciting adventure where we bask in the warm glow of God's holy presence. Prayer would be easy and angels would come out and dance on every page of the Bible. We also thought that all our Christian brothers and sisters would be well-meaning people who would care for our soul. This is not the case. We all endure seasons of struggle. But why is struggle necessary? Let's seek to answer this question. Let's return to the struggle the disciples experienced straining at the oars. The question that doesn't seem to be asked is, did Jesus know when he put his disciples in the boat 
that a storm was waiting for them. Should our answer be yes to this question, then why didn't Jesus get in the boat with them? What possible reason could Jesus have in sending his disciples out into the lake to struggle against the wind? Mark chapter 6 verse 45 seems to indicate that Jesus was in a hurry to put his disciples in a boat and send them across the lake. Why the rush? The apostle John answered the question. The people were stunned by this miraculous sign and they wanted to make Jesus their king by force. The reaction of the crowd must have saddened Jesus because they missed the whole point of his message and the miracle. It's evident that the crowd didn't want a Messiah. They wanted a political king who would free them from the Romans. Be careful to not separate the disciples from the crowd who followed Jesus because they were Jewish also. The crowds wanted a political king, so did the disciples. They also looked to Jesus to restore the kingdom of Israel. The crowd didn't understand. But there was still hope for the disciples to learn their faith lesson. The second part to his lesson would occur on the lake while the disciples strained at the oars. Should Jesus cause the wind to die down too soon before fear and frustration had set in, then the disciples would not have learned their faith lesson of being dependent upon him. Again, let me stress that the disciples were educated as Jews. They had no concept of faith in the Messiah and being dependent upon Christ. What did a proper faith response look like? The disciples had no idea. All they saw was the storm and Jesus wasn't with them. All night, the disciples fought against the wind, and their fear grew. At 3 a.m., during the fourth watch of the night, the disciples were terrified by a ghost seen upon the water. This must be the specter of death, and they were about to die. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. The ghost turned out to be Jesus, who climbed into the boat and calmed their fears with the wind. Lesson taught, but was the lesson learned? According to Mark, the disciples were completely amazed, but they still did not understand because their hearts were hardened. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Again, let's not be too hard on the disciples. The fog of human reason clouded the truth that Jesus was Lord of all. 
our spiritual fog does the same thing. It causes us to lose our bearing and our compass direction. We could be surrounded by hundreds of people, but still not know our direction. Following the crowd is not going to show us the path of Christ. The disciples needed to learn the lesson of being dependent upon Jesus, and so do we. It is easy to think that being dependent upon Jesus is a weakness, but it is not. As we learn to be dependent, we learn to navigate through life by trusting our spiritual compass points and the instruments that are necessary for life. The Apostle Paul got to a place where he was thankful for his weaknesses and struggles. He wrote, To keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul had a problem and his problem could cause him to stumble. Paul wrestled with pride and self-exaltation. He was conceited. There is no doubt, Paul experienced great revelation in his walk with Jesus Christ. His constant struggle was to be conceited about his relationship with Jesus. In his own mind, he elevated himself above others. Without this weakness being checked, Paul would stumble in his faith. Therefore, the Lord gave Paul a thorn in the flesh to torment him. We don't know what the thorn was. It could have been physical or spiritual. It's unknown but it clearly was a storm sent from God. Three times Paul pleaded with the Lord to take away his thorn in the flesh, but the Lord would not remove his torment. The Lord allowed Paul to strain at the oars. Finally, Jesus spoke to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul's thorn in the flesh was designed to humble Paul and to force him to be dependent upon Christ. In fact, Jesus taught Paul that his power is made perfect through weakness not strength. What does it mean to be perfect? Webster's Dictionary defines perfection as being entirely without fault or defect, flawless, satisfying all requirements, accurate, corresponding to an ideal standard or abstract concept faithfully reproducing the original. It is interesting to note that the New Testament does not support our 
English concept of perfection. The Greek word used in verse 9 is teleo, which means to complete or accomplish an action. But there is another Greek word used in the New Testament for perfect, and that word is katartsao, which means to complete, to repair, to adjust, to restore and mend. Paul learned that the struggles he endured exercised his faith to the point that the power of God could be channeled through him. Paul's struggles were the catalysts used by God to create in him a dependency on Jesus Christ free from conceit. Jesus used Paul's struggles to mend, restore, and set back in right order his attitude so that the power of God could rest on him. It's important to notice that Jesus used Paul's struggles to manifest his grace in Paul's life. The issue of grace is the key. Let's read in the book of Hebrews. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's consider this thought. As long as we don't have a need, we won't approach the throne of grace. Our struggles are designed to expose our need. The New Testament supports the truth that Jesus Christ will meet us at the level of our need. The struggles we experience will eventually cause our needs to surface, and it is at this time that we want to draw near to the throne of grace so that we might obtain mercy. The more we become dependent upon Jesus Christ, the more we'll experience His love and grace. James is right. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Our trials and struggles are designed to exercise our faith and expose our need. We will commune with Jesus only to the degree we need Him. Let's return to our struggling disciples on the Sea of Galilee. Did Jesus ignore the possibility that He was putting His disciples at risk? Why wasn't Jesus with his disciples in the boat? Should we think that Jesus wasn't with his disciples because he was not physically with them in the boat, then we are making the same mistake the disciples made. We read in verse 48, that Jesus saw his disciples straining at the oars. Jesus was with them. He may not have been physically in the boat, but he was with them. He had everything under control. This may be true. So then, 
why didn't Jesus come to their aid? Maybe the intercession of Jesus was conditioned upon the disciples calling out in faith. Jesus waited until their strength was gone and fear had taken control. Jesus finally met his disciples at the level of their need. They were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Mark then said that Jesus climbed into the boat and the wind died down. With Jesus in the boat, the remaining trip across the lake became effortless. Jesus just made the miraculous personal. It's one thing to rejoice when we see the power of Christ manifest in our congregation, but it's another thing to see the power become personal. During our seasons of struggle, Jesus wants to be personal with us by calming our fears and stimulating our faith. Consider this thought. Is Jesus with you even though you don't see him in the boat? Is he seeing you strain at the oars? The answer is yes. He does see your struggle. He is calling out to you. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. To what degree do we trust the Lord? Do we trust him to lead us out of the storm when he leads us into one? Is the Lord our shepherd or is he not? We all must answer this question. One of the most beloved chapters found in the Bible is Psalms 23. We all like thinking about green pastures and still waters, but do we fail to notice that the Good Shepherd could lead us through the darkest valley filled with shadow and death? Can we trust the Shepherd who leads beside still waters to also lead us out of our darkest valleys. The thing that makes our valleys so dark is the spiritual fog that surrounds us. Can we trust the Good Shepherd to lead us out of our fog even when we don't sense His presence? There are seasons when we must simply trust the Lord to lead and guide us. The gift the Lord brings during these seasons is not the end of the struggle, but He being there with us. Many are the witnesses who testify that their dark valley seasons became opportunities for great growth in their faith. Just remember that our struggles are opportunities for Jesus Christ to become personal to us. The storm of Mark chapter 6 was not the first time the disciples were on the Lake of Gethsemane during wild weather. Mark wrote, That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, 
just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that they were nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. In Mark chapter 4, the disciples were on the same body of water, and a storm arose. But this time, Jesus was in the boat with them. Jesus being in the boat with his disciples did not cause a sudden outburst of faith. Even with Jesus in the boat, the disciples feared that they were going to drown. Their fear indicates that the disciples are still not sure who this Jesus is. Is he a prophet? John the Baptist seemed to think so. John believed that Jesus was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Jesus was an enigma. Did the disciples believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God? Not at this early date. The disciples truly did not know who this Jesus was. So, don't judge the disciples too hard, because we would have acted the same way. This incident teaches that the disciples had a limited degree of faith. They knew that Jesus could do something, but they did not know what. They awoke Jesus to maybe help with the oars. Jesus rebuked the wind and chided his disciples for their apparent lack of faith. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. We can infer from this incident that Jesus used the squall to exercise the faith of his disciples. The reaction of the disciples is a subtle reminder that they did not perceive Jesus as the Son of God. Did the disciples learn anything? Jesus would know. The storm in Mark chapter 6 is the test, but this time he was not in the boat. Matthew's Gospel provides a more in-depth description of this event. Let's read. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, 
and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Peter's response was a clear action of faith and trust in Jesus. But the test influenced each disciple also, because those who were in the boat worshipped Jesus and acknowledged that he was the Son of God. Jesus put his disciples in a position to grow in their spiritual maturity, and they apparently did grow. He knew that greater struggles lay ahead, and their faith needed to grow. A cross was coming, and a death, the death of a dream, the death of the Messiah. Would the disciples still trust Jesus even though he is dead? Would they trust his promise that he would rise again? Their faith needed to grow quickly. The storm on the lake would not be the biggest test of the disciples' faith. What lay ahead was lives filled with persecution and martyrdom. The result is that the disciples stood firm in their persecution. They trusted in Jesus and responded as men who were mature in the faith, strong in the Spirit. Jesus may have you out in the boat right now because he is preparing you for greater assignments in life. The problem is that you are too focused on the wind and the waves that you can't see the Savior who is present and trying to grow you in the faith. Why does God allow struggles in life? He uses our struggles to expose our weakness. And when we are weak in our own strength and ability, we are strong in Christ. Remember, Jesus came to give us a relationship with God, not a religion about God. Jesus will meet us at the level of our need. It is only through our struggles that our religion about Jesus becomes a relationship with Jesus. Let's not deceive ourselves. We all endure trials and sorrows while on this earth. We all experience death and loss. Struggles are a part of life. They will not go away. We read in the Gospel of John, I have told you all this so that you will have peace of heart and mind. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but cheer up, for I have overcome the world. In this world we will have many trials and sorrows, but cheer up, because Jesus has overcome the world. You are not alone in your struggle. Take the time to quiet your fears, and you might hear Jesus say, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It is difficult to spend your life straining at the oars. 
fear and self-doubt will erode your faith to the point that you slip beneath the waves of despair and frustration. Should you want rest for your soul, then you must see Jesus in the boat with you. Just remember, in Christ you are only one boat width away from your provision and peace. Your faith will grow in the midst of your fog.